of altars. What, what is an altar? What does it look like? What is the danger of it? What is the danger of it? Amen. And in the process of doing that, we had a look at um, amen, Jacob establishing a, an altar. We look at Genesis chapter 28. And we, we look from 11 through 19 when Jacob had a dream. Amen. And realized, he said, that, no, amen. I'll quickly do a quick little recap and then, then I want to move off of that. And then we look at also at Genesis 35. The Lord bring back Jacob to Bethel. Amen. And he prepared to go and re-establish the altar. So quickly to recap there, let's quickly pick it up back at Genesis chapter 28, verse 11. We won't read all of it. And then we want, I want to jump into the word. I'm closing the series off today. Amen. It's only a two-part. So Genesis 28, verse 11. Amen. We're right with you. Jacob, if you remember the story, he's running from his brother. And quickly, I'm going straight into it, because we were there already. And he came to a certain place and stayed there overnight, because the sun was set. Taking one of the stone of the place, he put it under his head and lay down there to sleep. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And the angels of the Lord were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood over and beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, forefather. Amen. And the God of Isaac, I will give to you and to your descendants the land on which you are lying. So right where you are lying, I'm going to give to you I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac. Amen. And your offspring shall be as countless as the dust of the sand, of the ground, and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south, and by you and your offspring, amen, shall the families of the earth be blessed and bless themselves. And behold, I am with you and will keep you, watch over you, amen, with care, note in taking notice of you wherever you may go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done all, amen, of which I have told you. So God is showing Jacob this in, in a dream and telling him, stand next to him and telling him everything that's going to happen. And Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, surely the Lord, amen, is in this place. And he went on to say, and I did not even know it. I didn't even know. And he was afraid and said, how to be feared, amen, and reverence, amen. You, you went on to say, is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gateway to heaven. He said, this place here is the house of the Lord. And this is the gateway that connects, one of the places that connect earth and heaven together. And Jacob arose early in the morning and took the stone he had put under his head. And he set it up. Amen. For a pillar, a monument to the vision in his dream. And he poured oil on it. And he poured oil on its top in dedication. And he named that place Bethel, the house of God. But the name, amen, of that city was lost at first. So this is Jacob experience finding in one of the gateway of the Lord. Just he said, I didn't even know it was there. He just came and he got there's a portal where angels come down from heaven and go back up. Where God stands over, and there God bless him. God will probably keep his word. He went to Jacob, but then he will bring him back in chapter 35 to this place. Amen. Jacob will bring his family and his people there, and God bless him and change his name Israel to Israel from Jacob in that place. We see much later on, amen. We will also then look at Kings, first king, we we'll look at chapter 12, verse 27 to 29. Solomon. And David's son was king at the time and Solomon was not walking the way of the Lord and the Lord had decided he's going to take away some of the kingdoms of the Lord, establish it. Amen. The son of, of Nebat, his name was Jeroboam, to become king over ten tribes. Israel was one, one unit. There were twelve tribes, but only two will stay with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, Benjamin and Judah, and the other ten tribes will go with Jeroboam. But Jeroboam was afraid that if he doesn't, if he, the people were... Uh, 
a scribe that they have to go where the Lord had established the altar to worship. And if the people keep going up to Jerusalem to worship to the prescribed altar, the place where God connects, they'll go back to the king. Amen? Or, um, king Rehoboam, Solomon's son, in Jerusalem. So he built an altar in a place where there's no gateway and changed the day when they were supposed to meet to come together to worship God, where God will be there. And again and again when you read the Bible, said, and this thing became a repetitive sin for Israel where they're missing the mark, worshiping at the wrong altar and on the wrong day, and they keep being taken into captivity. The effect of being in the wrong altar, amen. In fact, when Jeroboam, the Bible said this thing became a sin to Israel, a way for them to stop being effective in their life, a way for make them their worship become useless. So though they're worshiping, it is useless. And though they're trying to live, it's ineffective. All they keep doing, if you follow the story, I don't know if you have time to take you through it, all the story, it keep taking them into captivity. So they're, they're still engaged in action and doing things, but it's not bringing a favorable outcome. It's not bringing a blessing. They keep bringing what? Curse. So it became known as the sin of Jeroboam. The sin that leads you into captivity. And to this day, many of us are still following the way of Jeroboam. Amen? Which leading your life consistently into more captivity, more entanglement, and not in the blessing of the Lord. Very quickly, I'll show you that this pattern again. Go to uh, 2 Kings. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 15. Can't do all of it, but I'll give you a little bit. 2 Kings chapter 15. what happened, 2 Kings chapter 15, give you a verse in two seconds, but you'll see the same pattern again and again and again, oh, sorry, I'm in Samuels, that's why, I'm in 2 Samuels, Kings I'm looking for, 2 Kings chapter 15. You'll see the same pattern again and again and again. His sons continue in the same pattern. Let's go to verse uh, 28. 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 28. The Bible said, He did evil, amen, in the Lord's sight. 2 Kings 15. 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 28. Gotcha. Yeah. He did evil in the Lord's sight. He did not depart from the sins of what? Jeroboam, Jeroboam son of Nebat. Amen. Which he had made Israel sin. He continued worshiping at the wrong altar, doing the same things, and the effect continued to be the same again and again. Amen. And but you'll see this again and again and again. They, they're now worshiping in a place where God, God has prescribed, set up place where he will meet with man. And God is a God of integrity, meaning he doesn't compromise. He doesn't betray himself. If he said this is the place we are going to meet, and this time, guess what? He's integral. He will be at that place at this time. The sin of Jeroboam is like, I am not going to the prescribed place. I'm going to go to a place of my liking, what I set up, what I want. You can do that. But you have to be your own God and your own one. Poor tool, someone trying to establish it to him. God, 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 I don't support that. He goes, you can campaign as much as you want. I just don't support that campaign. So we need to understand if I'm not at the appropriate altar, it has significant effect. Significant effect on me and those around me, my future, my destiny, and so forth. And vice versa is the opposite too. When I follow the prescribed altar, like Jacob, God goes, I will follow you, I'll be with you, I'll watch over you, I'll notice you, and I'll bring you back. Amen. Just as you see he did in, ch in chapter 35 of Genesis, and I'll bless you. I'll make sure your life move accordingly, and you're moving according to my will. But those that are doing things contrary to what I set up, he gets my hurt. You got all the thousand cattle and everyone is mine. I sets up. 
the principles and the law, you don't get to change them. Imagine you, you, you own a business, you own a house, and you have set up certain rules and structure on what your business, and you put a store, and the store wants want to change all the rules, and you, know, you have to get your own house and your own business. This is mine. And these are the rules and the way, the principles, the governing principle, how I would like it to operate accordingly. The opposite is so too when we do it right. I want to show you someone that operated according to the principle of God and what happened. Right? Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to go from verse 11 to 15. So just like how Jacob find at Bethel, lost the, 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 the amen, that, he, that was called Bethel then, a portal, God had, there are many portals God have, but God have, but they're very specific. I want to show you another portal that he had given to Israel to work effectively, but when this is operating, and for thousands of years, men keep trying to find it. <coughs> Second Samuel chapter 6 from verse 11, he said, Amen when you're there. Uh, I'm using the Amplified Bible, page 3, 6 to 3 in the Amplified Bible. You can use any Bible. So, one of the things God gave Israel is the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. He said, that this is like an instrument of, of heaven. He said, this particular instrument, he said, where, that, where, where it is, it's sacred. I will be. Where it is, I will work through. Where it is, I will cover, I will protect. Outside of it, he said, I will not work. So the Bible went on to say, from verse 11, And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, amen, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So the opposite happened where God is in presence is or anything God controlling, blessings what? Flourish. But anything God does not set up, guess what? He didn't flourish it. In the book of Psalm, the Bible said, rising up early and staying up late at night, if the Lord does not establish the place or that house, the Bible said what? In vain you are waking up early and in vain you are staying up what? Late. Because that thing is not... You see, one of the things you've got to remember, because we didn't create the hurt on ourselves, we don't get to sanction how it works. It's the one who created gives what? Sanction. God said, because it's my hurt, and the cattle and the people and everything is mine, he said, all sanction comes from what? Me. And he got when you do things amen, that you shouldn't do, then you got I will sanction what? Against it. We saw this recently. When Russia attacked Ukraine, what did many countries start to do? They start to sanction against them. Cut off this, cut off that. They will not. Because if you're no longer in alignment with how we're supposed to be living. Yeah. Well, vice versa. When you go against God's prescribed way, what do you think happen? Amen? You will raise sanction against you. So here we see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Where it is, the Lord is sanctioned, but it's blessings upon blessing. You understand? Know and the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obedidim, we meant the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obedidim, and all is also. Look what happened. And it was told King David, you know, the Lord has blessed the house of Obedidim, and all that belongs to him. You know? You went on to say, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God amen, from the house of Obed-Edom into the city amen, of David with rejoicing. David understand this principle. Where the gateway is, where the covenant is, blessings what? Follow. Yeah. And where it's not, the opposite is happening. Yeah. The opposite is happening. So you need, when you, when you come to an altar, a place to worship God, you need to find out where, amen, is the ark? Where is the anointing? Where is the altar? Where is the connecting point between heaven and earth? Where is the medium God going to administer through? Do you understand this process? Yes. Because the opposite, you're still doing all the work and effort, but instead of the blessing come, and notice what happened. Did just in Obedium house God bless? No. Everything that connected him. But how do you think curse worked in? Everything that connected you. It's not just you get cursed or your wife or your children or. It's you and everything connected. This is why sometimes in ancient times, it spreads. 
It's a cancer. It spread. This is sin knows to say. When sin get into one man, the Bible says by one man sin would happen. All of humanity fall under the, the spell of it, the infection of it. Blessing worked the same. This is why the lady that was bleeding for 13 years, you know, she knew the health. Here's the health of God walking Jesus. If I can just touch him. She didn't even ask him, but Jesus said, health has just left me. The only thing she needed was faith. One of the, one of the interplay, one of the principles Amen. Of heaven. And once she had this connection, once she had the parent of faith, amen, she can connect to him and draw health out of him. So Obedidim, whole house and family, everyone connected him. So David heard and David sent. Amen. And said, bring the ark up to me. Amen. I want it in the city of David. He went out to say, and when those who bore the ark, then it is where now he's going to bring it up into the city. Amen. To get it to the place where he, he makes sure he has a connection, amen, with the Lord continuously and one that perpetually brings in what? Blessing. Now the same way that like the ark operate or the gate we have a blessing, there are many things. We see this when Israel was fighting, amen, the city I. Amen. And one of the Israelites brought something, the Bible said, that was made for destruction into the camp. And Israel started to lose all their power. They started to get contaminated. They started to get weak. And when Joshua on the ground crying, God, go get up. You have something that's weakening you in your camp. You have something that is making you, amen, operate in a curse, operate, amen, in a, in a defeated state, weakening you, like a kryptonite, weak, uh, weakening Superman instead of something that's giving you, helping you with power to deal with the man. So there are things that aid in human, amen, given by God, amen, that, that, that they're given by God that will aid human being, amen, in being effective, and there are things that what? Does not. It will weaken. So you need to know which altar you're at. Is it one that will bring blessing to you and your family and your household and the generation to come, or one, amen, that is closing now you, it's a curse, you, your family, your household, and so forth, and so forth. You need to identify. Different altars have different effect. Because all Jeroboam did was build an altar that bring a curse. Because he was afraid unto him, his household, his, his children, amen, and, and, and Israel. The Bible said this thing become a sin to Israel, a way for them to keep habitually operated in a curse and under a curse. We need to stay away from the curse. We need to make sure we are operating under the prescribed altar. Meaning, the one God has pre-set up. He has already, the Bible teaches us this, the Bible said, on one hand, God created good, right on the, on the right hand. And what did he create right next to it? Evil. But he has something, based on what he wants to do, create to do evil, and some things create to be good. We were designed to operate in the, in the penance and the things that deals with good. But we touch evil. We touch evil. The Bible said the wrath of the wicked, the things that punishes the wicked, will not come, amen, on the righteous unless we get our hand touching what? The things we should not be touching. We want to make sure we are under the prescribed altar so we are getting the blessing like Obedidia, like, amen, like Jacob, and so forth. Now, before I get into another component of this process, amen, I want to um, show you another altar. So we see, we, we, the first one we saw was in Genesis chapter 28 and 35. We saw a gateway flowing from heaven to earth. Here then we see the Ark of the Covenant. Amen. The Ark operating like a gateway that allowing God to operate powerfully where wherever this Ark is. We see every, heaven is able to influence that area tremendously. Or that family, or your spirit, or your soul, or your body, and everything connected to it. We see the opposite of that too, what it did to Israel. Amen. But there are other kind of altar too, that God, or other, or other kind, I like to think of them, amen. There are other kind of um, opening God has set up to bless humanity. God is always looking for a way to bless humanity. Equally, evil is always looking for a way to contaminate humanity, to stop them from operating in, in, in the blessing. In essence, God is always trying to look to make your life easier, more effective, more successful. But a counter force looking to make your life more hellish. And if you're careless and reckless and don't know what you're doing, you're going to end up experiencing the effect of operating on that inappropriate or incorrect altar. You're set up yourself under a portal, a portal that is meant for curse. 
event instead of blessed. I want to show you another altar. Go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Verse 22. We have seen, as I said, the ladder, the gateway, the Jacob said this is nothing but more than a, 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 a gateway between heaven and earth. We see the Ark of the Covenant, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. You know, people, I, I love that analogy, sanctions. Sanctions are resources. If we were unlimited, no problem. But if we're designed to worship and get resources from God, you better pay attention to Yes. Them. They control the resources. Of course. Of course. Yes. When, when, as I said, when, when you see the countries we're doing in Russia, they just cut off resources. We ain't going to send you this. We ain't going to trade with you. And yeah. when someone's trying to pull out a sanction, you're in trouble. No, this is exactly. So all the enemy does, when he gets you to operate out of the prescribed and you're, uh, you're offending the creator, operating out of his principle, you see, in, 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 in Romans 8, chapter 1, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the, the, amen, the Bible said, For the law of the spirit of life, amen, in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, amen, bring you in union with Christ Jesus. So the law of the spirit is to keep your life in union with Christ Jesus. And the Bible said, when your life is matching up with Jesus' life, your union, the Bible said there's no condemnation. You see, when your life is matching Jesus' life, the law of the spirit of life, amen, in union with Christ Jesus, it said, it will keep you free from all the way, amen, of sin and death, all the way to keep making mistakes that bring you out of union and to experience the effect of death. So one of the... I'm coming right back to Corinthians quickly. You don't have to go there. I'm just going to that scripture I'm quoting. I'm just going to Romans chapter 8 quickly. Um, you stay, you stay in 2 Corinthians. I'll be right here. So Romans chapter 8, verse 1 said, yeah, after verse 1 and 2, it said, Therefore there is, where am I? Yeah. Therefore there is now no condemnation. Amen. No judging, guilt of wrong for those, amen, who are in Christ, who live and walk, amen, not, say, not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the spirit. So there's no judging for those that are operating in alignment with Christ. And then it went on to say verse 2, for the law of the spirit, the perpetual, the principle, amen, of the spirit of life, which is, went on to say, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, amen, has freed me from sin and death. So he said, if I keep operating to the law of the Spirit, amen, in the NIV, to the law of the Spirit of life in union with Christ Jesus, it will keep me operating in alignment where I'm not operating any, any, under any kind of judgment, falling under sin in any way or anything that deals with death. So there's no need, in essence, for God to put sanction on me. But outside of the spirit of life that is in union with Christ Jesus, you will do things that will force God to put what? Sanction. Because God will not empower you to do what? Evil. Soon as you come out from the things that deal with life, that threatens his planet, threatens his people, threatens his portal, his connection to the people on earth or to the planet, what will he put in you? Sanction, scarcity. You show Israel going into captivity. Israel loses all their abundance, lose their way of life, lose their freedom. Lose their family. You will start losing everything. Now, unfortunately for you, you have an enemy. One of the things I've told you many times, God and some of his family is fight, are fighting. There's a civil war going on between God and some of his children in heaven. We just caught in between this fight. So as a result, we were made to be blessed. But they have tempted us to do things contrary to God, so we're no longer in union with God. So heavy sanction can be placed upon you. You can have minor sanction not affecting you much. Some embargo that's not a major. But you, you can have some major embargo that's nothing going on for you. And when we are sinning and operating out of the law of spirit, there's major sanction. And the, the worst thing, as you see when you read uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, the sanction just doesn't go on you. Your family and those who are connected to you. Your lineage can be affected under major severe sanction. No, 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 no more children for this one. 
no food, no clothes, no understanding whatsoever that sanction is. Amen? In Hosea 4, 6, God said, my people are dying for lack of knowledge. And then he sanctioned the priest. He said, because you reject knowledge, I'll reject you and what? Your children. He said, the sanction I'm putting on you is not just for you. It's for you and what? Your children because you reject knowledge. You go, I have created you, he said, to know things, to understand things, to be in the learning class. And then they want to learn. So he said, because you reject knowledge, you know, you reject learning. You go, okay. But he said, I'm going to tell you. He said, here's my sanction as a result. Here's my reaction to you, what you did. I'm going to reject you. And I'm going to reject your children. Because if you can't do it right, the only thing you can teach them is what? To commit the sins of Jeroboam. Yeah. I would not to do it right. And you see Jeroboam children, if you if, I, I, I think I took it to 2 Kings chapter 15. You should read from verse 1 if you have some time. After he passed, what do you think his children did? They operate under the same principle of keep missing the mark. So the sanction that was upon their father and the kingdom of fall upon them and so forth and so forth. So, we want to operate under God's blessing. His blessing, not His sanction. To do this, we need to operate according to His principle. Where the ark was is where you needed to be. Where the gateway is is where you need to be. This is exactly when God appeared to uh, Jacob back in Genesis 35. He said, go back to the place where you first what? Met me. Amen. He said, go back there. It is there you have to come back to be blessed. Amen. Though God followed him, when it was time for God to deal with him, he brings him back to the place that is prescribed, preset, where you should meet. I want to show you another altar. Amen? 2 Corinthians, are we there? Yes. Chapter 1, verse 22. This one deals with the church. I'm going to pick it up from verse 21. Just to leave it in. But it is God who confirms and makes us steadfast and establish us. Amen? In, in joint fellowship with you in Christ. And has consecrated and anointed us. Whoever went on, we not to say amen. Ended us with. Amen, and doing us with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it's a God who establishes us and anointed us. Amen? And then doing upon us the gift of the Holy Spirit. He went on to say in verse 22, He has also appropriate and acknowledged us as His by putting His seal upon us and giving, and giving us His Holy Spirit in our heart as a secure deposit, a guarantee, amen, of the fulfillment of His promise. So he said, God gives us the Holy Spirit, amen, put Him as a seal, that, amen, that we belong to us by giving us, amen, his mark, a token of his promise into our heart. So part of God marking, this is my, this is my area that I have blessed. This is my people that I have blessed. The very spirit that he did, that I have, which is my Holy Spirit, my life-giving spirit, the very spirit that I give to Jesus, now I give to the church. I have given to them as a token of my promise, a deposit into their heart. That they have a way now of communicating with me. It is because of this altar that is set up now in the church, in their heart. We're going to talk a little bit more about this. For the church, the individual, I'm not talking the building here. I'm talking the individual, every Christian, that accept Jesus as the Son of God, and God raised him from the dead, and he's the Lord, and their Lord, and the Christ, the Messiah. God said, I will give them my Holy Spirit, the very Spirit that, amen, that sustained me and carries me in and sustain Jesus, I now give it to them as a part of my promise to them that they belong to me, and now they have a direct portal that they can communicate with me, and I can communicate to them, so there's no need for me to put sanction on them. Hence why he said in Hebrews 11, he said, those that have my Holy Spirit, that I've established an altar in their heart, I will discipline. If they have issue, I will discipline. He said, if I'm not disciplining them, they don't have this mark. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9 and 10, the Bible says, anyone who does not have the Holy Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit of Jesus does not belong to him. Because you do not have an altar establishing you. You still can be sanctioned heavily based on what you're doing. 
So Romans 8 and 9 said, For you to be one that mark belongs to God, and one that have an altar established in, meaning God can communicate. You see, you're going to learn something. Whatsoever, the Bible said, only the spirit in a man knows the mind of a man. And the reason God gives you his spirit, one is for you, everyone, and for you to know your belong to him. But the second part, because now you're operating in the same spirit, the same frequency, what God is speaking or thinking, you should be knowing. Because you are in, now you are in the exact channel. You're using the exact same frequency. So this is why Jesus said, you're no longer my servant, I call you friends. Because your servant don't know their master what? Business. But you the fact you have my spirit now, you can know what I'm thinking and doing. I now call you what? My friends, my brothers. Amen? So the church have a personal altar established. We see the ark, amen? As a heavenly ark um, altar. We see the gateway as an heavenly, but the church have been given the Holy Spirit into their heart. And as the verse before said, establishing them. Verse 21 said, But it is God who confirms and makes us steadfast and establish us in joint fellowship, amen, with you in Christ. God have established you now in Christ and joined you to Christ through the Holy Spirit in you. Amen? And the Bible said, and consecrate and anoint us and do in us with the gift of the Holy Spirit. He has also appropriate, amen, and acknowledge us as His by putting His seal upon us and giving us His Holy Spirit in our heart as a security deposit and a guarantee of the fulfillment of the promise. He could have promised but didn't give you anything and, you, and he's trustworthy and integral, you should still have faith. But God said, I'm going to give you something to validate that now you can operate, amen? Not by me sanctioning you, but by me blessing you. So for the church, God wants to bless you continuously and I've put the spirit upon you where he doesn't have to sanction you. Does this mean Amen? He done, he's not going to discipline you. He made that absolutely clear. He said, though I've put you in a position now to be blessed continuously, amen? He said, those I love, I'll tell their fault. He said, amen? He said, no discipline is fun, but I'll discipline you so you're not illegitimate children. He said, which father does, amen, who loves their children and do not discipline them? You don't want them to walk in the way of righteousness. Now I'm going to show you a little shortly why you need to be disciplined and why do you give you the spirit to operate in the blessing while you continue to, bless, to um, discipline you also. We're going to talk about that shortly. Right. So the, the people that don't have that personal altar, they definitely get sanctions. Yes. But yes. the children get disciplined. Very yes. different. Very different. There's a big difference by being sanctioned. Now the enemy, be careful with this. If you don't understand the difference being, by being sanctioned, having a resource cut off from you and disciplined, he will go... God is sanctioning you instead of disciplining you. No. God said, because I love you, I'm going to discipline you. When I'm sanctioning, I'm punishing you. When, 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 when sanction has been placed upon you, things are being what? Taken away, cut off. Whether it's your health, your time, your freedom, your resource. Something is being what? You are being limited. Sanction limits you. Yeah, I don't know if you ever see a country operate in, in, under an embargo, what happened? Certain country doesn't want to interface with them. Certain place doesn't want to interplay with them. You understand this process? So this is what this is what happened. This is what sin did to humanity. Heaven was supposed to keep blessing humanity, but Satan tempted Eve to get herself into a situation where instead of blessing, sanctions start to be passed. Even sanction of life, God said, "You're no longer going to live so long." A sanction. You no longer can live in Eden. Sanction. Bronze sky. You know, the hurt. No longer going to respond. It's like bronze. Sanction. Things just not working for you anymore. You just used to, you know, just have to look and things was open for you. Just speak. You got nothing going to respond to you anymore. Thank God. The only way you have to avoid that, you better find a gateway. Like what Jacob found. Or you better find God's ark. So uh, what you're trying to do is get around the sanction. You're trying to get around the sanction. I want you to be clear with this because sometimes some of us are confused. We think the sanction and the hurt have lift. No. God just gives us a way to what? Get around it. The ark allows you to get around the sanction. 
The sanction that he placed on Adam, which is placed on what? Was it just Adam? Notice what the blessing of Obadiah was upon him and his household and his lineage. What do you think happens with the sanction of Adam? Same thing. The sanction God put on Adam was put in humanity. The gateway gets us, the sanction is still there, but you have a way of operating. It's almost like you have a spot that's not sanctioned. The heart does the same. Now the Holy Spirit in your heart, the seal, the deposit, the guarantee, allows you to operate amen, outside of the sanction, or where the sanction is not affecting you, because you have the Holy Spirit. Is what the Bible saying? In the end, these two or three of them will grab a Jews and say, you know, I'll, I'll lay hold of him. I mean, you know the way of God. They will not leave. And what does that mean? We know the way of operating in God and blessing outside of what? The sanction. Because how can we in such a challenging time and a scarcity time, how can you be increasing? Why? You have a way in spite of a time and a season and a period of humanity sanction, you somehow, which is the way of God, have a way of operating outside or the sanction not impacting you. And this is God's mercy. So God said for the church, the church, this is why the church is so unique. The church is an entity, but how? You need to understand why they're unique. They're unique because they were, they were consecrated. They were given the Holy Spirit into their heart that allows them, amen, to operate in a state where the sanction does not apply to them. Do you understand? This was so wonderful in the earlier church. Uh, Paul said, because now we have our freedom, should we use it for what? Evil? Should we say, because no sanction shall touch us, shall we just be like, amen, crazy and do crazy things? Because no, far be it. Where sin was increasing, grace is in, 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 abounding even more. Now because you are free to operate outside of the sanction, you should bless more people. And show people what it's like to operate under the gift, the token of God. So humanity can return to the place where God intended humanity to be operating in. Amen? In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. For the church, this altar is impure. It's very, very important. Now, this is the one Jesus was talking about. In the gospel, Jesus came and there was, he came to a well and he was thirsty. And there was a Samaritan woman drawing water. So he asked her for some water. She gave her nothing to you. Draw the water away. And she so actually further more than that. You, you're Jews. You Jews do not talk to a Samaritan, but just asking us for anything. And he turned to the woman, if you know who was asking you for water, you will ask me for water. So she said, you know, and then he said, water you are giving people will drink it and they'll thirst again, but the water I will give you, you'll never thirst again. Live in water. So she said, sir, give me this water. And then she asked him another question. She got another question for you. You Jews say, eh? the only place God accepts now is prescribed or, or ascribed is Jerusalem, the altar that was built by Solomon and it was dedicated to the Lord. And then the Lord present fall, the sanction was lifted after, the, after it was dedicated. And the Lord present fall upon that temple, and the Israelites were charged, you have to come up to Jerusalem to worship. She goes, but our forefather, amen, which is, which, 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 which is Jacob, she goes, he give us this well, amen. I think, it, I think it's, uh, she goes, and, and this, he, he said to come up with this mountain we should worship, which I think is it's Mount Gazim, what is it? See? Yes. Uh, or Gerizim, I think, I think it's Mount, okay. Mount Gerizim. Okay. Amen? Gerizim. Gerizim. Mount Gerizim. She said, this is the mountain that they said, amen? And the people used to travel there three times a year. They had to go up to Mount Gerizim to worship the Lord. So she asked him, she, she asked him, she said, Lord, should we come to Jerusalem, to the Temple Solomon built, or should we come up to Mount Gerizim, where our forefathers, amen, tell us we have to worship, where they have to go pilgrimage three times a year to come to worship there. To worship there. You know, and the Lord Jesus turned and said, You will not go up to Mount Gerizim or you will not go up to Jerusalem. He said, A time is coming and it's upon you, amen, where you will worship God in spirit. Now, where did the spirit come from? Where you will worship God in spirit. You won't come to Jerusalem and you won't go to Mount Gerizim. Because God has given you now His Holy Spirit, His communication. Now, why did they have to go? Because this was where God's spirit was. They had to go to Mount Gerizim, God's spirit, that's where the spirit was. But why did they have to go there anymore? Why, how come the church don't have to go? Why don't we have to travel to Jerusalem? Why don't I have to travel to Mount Gerizim? Why? Why? God, Jesus said, we will have to worship. In, a time is coming, you can worship in spirit and truth. Because the same spirit we were going to see is now with us. 
So now I have a way to contact God anywhere, anytime. Even better than Jacob. When Jacob was traveling, God was offering hope for him to travel with Jacob. But even to Jacob to speak to God, he has to come back to the place where God's spirit operates. God was watching and noticing. We have a spirit of God direct communication. This is the whole idea of the, um, the benediction. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our God and the sweet union and communion of what? The Holy Spirit, the sweet companion, this constant communication. So through Jesus' grace we got this. Because God so loved us, he took us out of the embargo. Amen. And he gave us the spirit. When Paul blessed the church of Corinthians, he got, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet union and communion of the Holy Spirit always be with you. Amen. Jesus is the one who said it up. God so love it, we receive it. <laughs> Amen. So now we don't need to go to Mount Gerizim. We don't need to go. People always go, Bishop, when are you taking a trip to Jerusalem? I'm like, why? Why? They, they, I don't know what they're after. They're after the gateway. I know why they're going there. They want to find a gateway. For thousands of years, men, they're looking for the Ark of the Covenant of God. They're trying to what? Find it. Why do they want it? What? Do you want to operate under sanction or obey the blessing? Very simple. I wouldn't. If I had a way of finding the ark and I couldn't find the Holy Spirit God I put into my heart as a deposit, I would try to find the ark. Unless, unless you like living under sanction. Who want to live a life that I can't be healthy? Who want to live a life I can't live a full life? Because sanction. Because you're not living past three, three, three score. You're not getting past 20. Your family will not spread out. Your family will not have peace. You will not have joy. God, if I'm not walking in my prescribed way, if I'm not happy, guess what? You are not going to be happy. If I'm, he said, if I'm a father or God, where is my honor? Where is my respect? He said, if I'm not going to get honor or respect, guess what's going to happen to you? In essence, it's almost like God said, if I ain't having no fun, guess what? Nobody having any fun. He's big enough and strong enough and bad enough to do it. No one can stop him. Amen? Job said, well, who, 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 who can I take it up with? Who? But God, if you can operate, he said, remember what he said, he said, never forget this. He said, I don't want your sacrifice. Uh, everything belongs to me. What do you say you need? Obedience. Obedience. He said, the things I've set up to operate, not to work against each other, not to undermine me or my system, that is far more important than your stupid sacrifice. He said, obedience is more important than what? Sacrifice. Salt so out, you can just sacrifice something and God will be very happy. But no, 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 no. That's going to bring you up. Saul was the first king of Israel. Was supposed to be passed on from generation to generation. But he disobeyed the Lord. What happened? Sanctions. Sanctions. Deadly one. Severe. He lost the kingdom to David. Solomon, God warned again. You know Solomon lost the kingdom? Sanctions. So God said, Jesus said, you no longer need to go to Mount Gerizim, or you need, no longer need to go to Jerusalem. He said, from now on, I give you my Holy Spirit. You see, please be very clear. But anyone, this is why I quote Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Anyone who does not have this Holy Spirit, they might want to go to Mount Gerizim, if they can locate where it is. And the mountain, they can find the, 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 or the portal, you mean, or try to find the heart. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, said, But you are not living the life amen, of the flesh. You are living the life of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit of God really dwells within you, amen, directs and controls you, but if anyone does not possess the Holy Spirit of Christ, amen, he is none of his. He does not belong to Christ. Amen. is not truly a child of God. It's if you do not have the Holy Spirit, the altar of God, the thing to get you out of the embargo, out of the sanction. You don't belong to God. You are still operating weird. 
under a curse. Life's going to be, and that's why sometimes, see if you understand this, you're very um, compassionate to humanity. People ask, well, why does people steal, and why do they fight? You know what it's like to live in an embargo all the time? You know what it's like to live under sanction? No help. No proper use of the mind, no proper use of the spirit, body, family, resource, time, energy. It is challenging. It makes you constantly feel like you want to covet. The problem with that, that gets you more unrighteousness and more sanction. But it's a way of God extend his hand to humanity and say, you know, he didn't say you have to go to Mongeriz, where we go, okay, here we are, I'm going to get you out of the sanction. Let's get to Jerusalem. He said, no, no. All you have to accept is what I extend to you, which is my son, the atonement for you being disobedient, what got you under the sanction. And he said, each one of us is going to do this for ourselves. He said, and I will give you, amen, my Holy Spirit in your heart, the very spirit that keeps me out of sanction. And then he said, you will start to experience the Obedient effect. Blessing when you come in, a blessing when you go, a blessing when you sleep, a blessing when you wake, and your children bless, and your words bless, and you believe, and your thoughts, and whatsoever you touch, like the Midas touch. The, the ark was a movable altar. Yes. We are now movable altars. Amen. We have the spirit in this tent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Yeah. The, the, the only challenge you got, God, now you have my spirit, you got, I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to talk about that soon. He said, I'm going to discipline you. All it means, I'm going to make you live according to this abundance you now have. You're going to use it appropriately. Amen? He said, now you, the same rules that are there to heaven now applies what? To you. The same, but at least you're no longer in an embargo. Amen? In the name of Jesus. So we have now, as Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, no longer will you go to Jerusalem or Mangarazim. But a time is coming now you can worship God. You can communicate God right from within your heart. That's why David said in Psalms 4, lie in your bed and communicate with your own what? Heart. You can communicate all the time with God. You don't need to go to Jerusalem. Before the people want to talk to God, they have to go to Jerusalem. And it wasn't a simple trip. This is why even the Mongarians in three times a year, that they pack up their whole family. And you make this, you make this, this pilgrimage. Like what the Muslim does when they go to um, Mecca. They might be. But now the church have it. Now the only thing I want the church to be careful with, what well, you have to learn to operate in the spirit. You become familiar and live according to the principle of the spirit. The Bible calls it, you must be filled and led by the spirit. You want all your belief, thoughts, words, and action to be um, evoked, start by the spirit. All of it to be prompted, directed from the spirit. Amen? For the church. And then you want to walk, walk and live in habitually in alignment with the Spirit, fulfilling Romans 8. Amen? Making sure the perpetual law, you, what you are living is in union with Christ Jesus and the Spirit will help you with that. So there's no condemnation falling upon you in that sense in the name of Jesus. Amen? Now, and the reason why that is, I want you to go to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of St. John. Gospel of St. John, chapter 16. I'm going to wrap this thing up. Gospel of St. John, chapter 16. We're going to pick it up uh, verse 6 through 8 and 8 through 12. It is, it is separated into two parts. So we went from 6 to 12. But I'm going to read first two verses and then I'll read three verses. St. So John 16. 16 from verse 6. First, the Lord is going to make a statement. Then he's going to show you the effects of the statement. So, and especially uh, uh, pertaining to the church. It's, it's pertaining to all humanity, but there's great emphasis on the church. God's judgment begins in the church. Let's pick it up, verse 6. Verse 6 said, I'm going to read 6 through 8 first. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart, taking complete possession of you, because Jesus makes a statement, he told him he's going away. He told him he's going away, so because he told him he's going away, they're very sad now. So he said, to the point, their heart is completely filled with sadness. Verse 7 said, 
So he said, however, don't get too sad. I am telling you, amen, nothing but the truth. He said, I can't lie to you. I have to go. When I say it, it is profitable, good, expedient, advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, the standby will not come, amen, to you. Into close, pay close attention, close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be, amen, in close fellowship with you. Because they go, what can be better than you with us? You're teaching us, you're protecting us, you're comforting us. It's wonderful. He go, but I'm telling you. For now, he go, where I am, you got to be. But when I say, if I go, even though I am not there, you will have someone with you, no matter where you go. For the lady, amen, she had to touch Jesus, her minimum Jesus had to send his word. You see? So you go, I am telling you, imagine you have someone blessing you, protecting you, this is the Lord Jesus, and he telling you he needs to go and it's good for you. But he told him, he said, listen, I'm not lying to you. I am telling you nothing but the truth. When I say it is more profitable, it's good, it's expedient, it's advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comfort that comes and the help of the advocate, the intercessor, the strength, and the one who will stand by you will not come to you in close fellowship. He cannot come when I'm here. He meant with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. Because I'll set up another altar. Come when Jesus is here, he knew all the portal, he can pray, and you can see Elijah, and amen. He can see Moses. He can stop the water. He can do anything. Why would you want that to leave? Let's continue. But not the same verse 8. And when he comes, amen. So it's first, so you can see verse 6, Christ said, I have to go for something to come to you. And it's it's for your benefit. Let me do this thing. Now he said, now he's going to change now when he comes. He's going to show, show them now. So first he tell them what's going to happen. Then he's going to give them the narrative. When he comes, what will he do? How do you know the Holy Spirit is there and what it's going to do? And when he comes, he will convict. Amen. And convince the world and bring. Amen. Demonstration to it about sin. You see, when the Holy Spirit comes, the one who's going to walk with you, he's going to convict and convince the world and start to demonstrate what sin is. Those that operate in an embargo and the sanction, and those that do not. Amen? And about righteousness. Upright, amen? Uprightness is that of heart and right standing with God. Amen? And about judgment. So you say, when the Holy Spirit come, when I go, and the one who I said come, he will convict and convince the world what sin is. What righteousness is to be in right standing with God. And what judgment is, what it's like to operate under a sanction. Notice he starts, amen, with sin. Because what gets you in trouble right away is what? Sin. What is violated? Righteousness. And anything that follows the righteousness falls under what? Judgment. Sanction begins. So it will show you, because man loves to go, this is not fear. So it will show you your sinning, violating the principle and the laws of righteousness. And as a result, this is why you have sanction in your body, your health, your family, your time, your marriage, whatsoever it is.